after uh, three days of uh, discussions of debates, I do believe uh, at at least for me, it's almost impossible to try to sum up. It was really uh, a spectacle of good ideas, excellent arguments, uh, signals for uh, today politicians in order to save or to shape the future. So I will not dare to try to uh, say a kind of uh, uh, conclusions. Probably these conclusions should be shaped in another format for the future. And uh, we discuss with uh, Gary Jacobs and uh, with our colleagues, if you will agree, because uh, cannot be done by a small group of people, maybe we'll be able to publish a book with your contributions. The World Academy of Art and Science, uh, together with my university, will uh, assure all the framework in order this book to be published to an international publishing house and to be visible. Our idea is to publish an open source book. So that means to be open to everyone. And uh, in this way, uh, for the richness of this uh, conference, three-day conference, will benefit more people than uh, the one who attended or the one who will uh, access the sessions on the web of the World Academy of Art and Science. As you know, all conferences are recorded and after that posted on uh, our uh, web page. So having said this, I will not, uh, because uh, time is uh, running, I will go directly inviting our uh, speakers today to express their opinion in the conclusion of this uh, excellent conference. And uh, Fernando Garcia, long time we haven't seen each other, but uh, we met years ago in the International uh, Association of University Presidents, a very strong global voice when uh, we talk about uh, higher education. So Fernando, you have the floor for the next uh, eight maximum maximum 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Th thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Remus, for this invitation. Gary Jacobs at the same time, Ramu Damodaran and, and Kaja Chengelia. So of course, the challenge when you're at the tail end of an event such as this is that whatever you say might have already been covered and your remarks might end up being irrelevant. So that clarified what I would like to share with you is just a, a few aspects pertaining not to the national level, but to the level of the presidencies and chief executive officers of universities. It is clear that before the pandemic, we, there was a call for disruptive innovation. When the pandemic hit, we all had to innovate disruptively or not, but we had to, we had no option. I think that one of the criticisms that higher education historically receives, which is that we're too slow to act, the pandemic forced us to react. The important thing of course, is not to continue coping with what has happened or the lingering situation but to try to make sense of how all of this impacts the post-pandemic era. I refuse to call it new normal because we've had new normals over the past 15 years, several already. So we'll just call it post-pandemic. And I think that uh, surely throughout the conference, there have been comments, uh, trends, best practices, I think what we need to realize is that from an emergency stage, we move to a transition stage. We need to be prepared for the transformation stage. I believe that what's important, again, highlighting the role of leaders is to underscore some of the things that we will be faced with. And that in one way or another, depending the context where we are at, 
depending institution that we lead in order to move forward and make effective the institutional mission. We, we had a, the triannual conference, Remus, in July. So we had 400 universities, 40 participants, and I will allow myself to draw without specifying who said it, a couple of things that I think would be important to uh, contribute to this panel. Number one, that as leaders, we need to embrace nimbility. We've heard of the concept of nimble and quick. Nimbility is a step further beyond that. We need to put on our bifocal lenses and exercise bifocal leadership, which is, of course, mining the here and now, stabilizing and balancing the institution, but rallying the forces, so to speak, to move forward. We also need to be focusing on short, accessible, laser precision types of skills that along with the aspiration of developing the whole person, we also need to reinforce in a different type of economy. The intercultural, the international, the development of the whole individual, I think needs to be uh, underlined. There are some concepts such as the academic bank of credit that our colleagues from India put on the table. And that's that uh, we need to acknowledge that throughout the life cycle in the future, more graduates will have concluded their studies having gone to more than just one or two institutions, maybe three, four, or five. And accordingly, higher education institutions need to be prepared to recognize, acknowledge that, and grant the appropriate recognition for that. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm taking one away from Paco, but he espouses more personalized programs and more individual learning, very important in the future. The pandemic taught us that student mental health and student success is an area that we need to emphasize. The previous speaker was talking about Einstein. Every society has Einsteins. We need as higher education institutions to seek and develop that talent, while at the same time considering diversity and inclusion as a strength, not as an obligation. We need to connect to the community much better. We need to show empathy, solidarity, flexibility, and opportunity. And I think that in the end, whatever we do, we need to be mindful of mission, quality, of course, operational and financial sustainability, and we need to be strategic. We cannot be all things to all people. And as university leaders, we need to be mindful of the fact that we are moving from what we call a university to a multi diversity, multiple constituents, multiple modes of delivery, multidisciplinary, multi many things. And accordingly, higher education has to rise to the occasion. Moving towards the concluding remarks, I'll draw a few things that Arthur Levine recently spelled out in the Chronicle of Higher Education in terms of where higher education might be headed. Number one, Institutional control will decrease and the power of consumers will increase. He establishes an analogy based on what has happened in the music, movie, and newspaper industry, where a lot of what is done is based on choice. Institutions will need to be positioned so that this can be offered to learners. New post-secondary entities will enter the marketplace. That has already been happening. The model of higher education focusing on time, process, and teaching will be eclipsed by a knowledge economy successor rooted in outcomes. The dominance of degree and just-in-case education will diminish, moving towards non-degree and towards what Levine calls just-in-time education, and where the future is going to be competency-based. All in all, I think that we need to, yes, take note of how we've been impacted negatively, but also of the positive things that have occurred. And in closing, I think that I would offer you a reflection or observation on the part of Tom Friedman, New York Times. 
More people have communicated, collaborated, and competed in more ways across more countries and with more people than ever before. We need to make sense of what we've experienced and prepare for the post-pandemic. Thank you very much for this opportunity on behalf of the International Association of University Presidents. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Fernando, for your uh, inspiring words. And also, it's important for us to have this connection with uh, an uh, organization which represents the president of universities across the world and an organization which has a very strong voice at uh, in globally, but also at the United Nations as you are affiliated to uh, UN as an NGO. Francisco, your work in the World Bank is very well known. You have worked not just in Washington, but uh, in different places. I, we met in Asia, we met uh, in other places while you were in the World Bank. Now you have another position in Kantar Foundation where you have already put there your, uh, your uh, let's say, uh, style of working and thinking. Please share with us uh, how do you see the future of um, higher education and how can we take the most from, a, when I say we mean society, from a better higher education? Thank you very much, uh, Remus. It's a real pleasure seeing you. And thank you very much, uh, Gary and members of uh, a, uh, the Academy for the uh, kind invitation and the opportunity to share perspectives at the end of uh, such an interesting uh, activities of this event. Uh, as Fernando had indicated, the risk of being the last ones is that people are just ready to close the door. As somebody who was invited to give a lecture and there was only one attendee and then that one attendee said, the only thing, I'm, the only reason I'm here is because I will shut down the door when you leave. So uh, I hope it is not the case today. So it, you know, it's a you know, it's it's a matter of constant uh, concern to think about the future. And even Albert Einstein used to say, "Who cares about the future if it will happen, no matter what?" But I think it is very important for us in this time to think about the future, mostly because we need to build the future rather than just waiting for the future to happen. So we have the great opportunity, the greatest opportunity, I might say, in the post-pandemic world, because it looks like planets have aligned. It looks like many of the reasons why we were always thinking that it is just impossible to foster change now are ready uh, for us to, to, to really embrace in such a change. Now, let me tell you briefly about what I believe are the key challenges that higher education is facing today. The first one, which is very important, is that we will need to adapt much faster than expected the higher education ecosystem in our countries towards what I refer to as the new digital economy and society. You know, the pandemic truly accelerated the digitalization of our economies and societies, and no matter what, we will need to adapt uh, higher education to such a new environment. Secondly, I think still it remains a significant challenge that has to do with access, equitable access, equitable retention and success in higher education, especially for the many in the world who have not benefited from it. That's what I refer to as the need to leverage um, a, um, a, and deliver better and more inclusive education. I think it is fundamental to think about that. The third one is how do we respond to the growing demand that is not met, but shifting demographics. I think this is gonna be something that we will need to seriously think about because no longer the students are the students that used to be. No longer we think about the student as the one who just finished high school. It is ready to be four years and an immersion and then getting out. That is a definition is completely outdated and we will need to really think seriously about the ones, again, which are not the conventional students and the many in the world for which access to higher education has been just a dream. Fifth and fourth, fourth, I'm sorry, it is precisely the need to find the right balance of, I might say, quality provision, but more important, relevance of higher education 
between the public and the private uh, sectors. You know, this dichotomy that has been made between the public and private providers, it is becoming blurred. And no matter what, we need to assure, despite of the type of institutions, we need to assure that we provide the best education possible, which is both good quality, but more important, relevant. And then the fifth one has to do, how do we embrace the idea of international dimension, global dimension, in an age in which it looks like that is a bad thing, in an age in which it looks like the national against the international becomes this tension that always we need to address. And then finally, and very important, we in higher education, institutions, and systems, how we really become flexible and adaptive learning organizations. There is too much that we learned in the pandemic about the many things that we do wrong. Fernando was making reference to them that definitely need to be addressed. We need to have universities which are much more flexible, much more student-oriented, and more important, much more adaptable to the realities of the future. Now, being said that, I think uh, at the end of the day, I think we need to think about what is the education uh, uh, purpose about? I truly believe, and this is what we believe at Qatar Foundation, that we should aspire to build the better future of our societies by nurturing capable, well-rounded, and value-driven human beings who are committed to lead and shape the communities in which they live. And the only way we can do it is if we provide them with the most possible better education, which is personalized, which allows them to make decisions about their own journey, and which is relevant. And in order to do that, we need to have inclusive and innovative ecosystems. And that's what we are trying to do at Qatar Foundation. You know, the, this ecosystem of more than 20 educational institutions from kindergarten to doctoral education, having top level universities in one single place and adding the dimension of research and more important, the dimension of community engagement are in my opinion, the fundamental elements that will make possible that dream of a better education for the future. Do we have a big challenge ahead? Absolutely. Is that something um, impossible to address? I don't think so. I am very optimistic that we really can achieve that. Planets have aligned, opportunities for change are ahead, and I truly believe that future is something that we will be able to build, a better future that next generations will need. Let me just finish with one quote that always I like to use from Paul Valéry. 93 years ago, he said, what it concerns us about the future today is that the future no longer is what it used to be. And in today's world, 93 years after, the future no longer will be what it used to be. And higher education institutions will have to be up to the standards of a world that nobody can anticipate how it will be, but there is no doubt that it will be much more different than the world in which all of us were educated. Though we need to change, we have no time, and this is the greatest opportunity of our time to make that shift in higher education. Thank you very much, Rivas. Thank you, Francisco. Unfortunately, we don't have too much time for debate, but for sure we have other opportunities because um, I will challenge you with your challenges on higher education with a lot of questions. Uh, building the future, not to wait for the future. But what about being focused to destroy the future? Because unfortunately, if we look at some public policies promoted today by different governments across the world, they build public policies using models from the last century. And uh, on this topic, uh, we can develop a lot. Also national, international, and so on. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you very su successfully in six minutes underlined really uh, very sensitive topics that should be discussed, not just among us, but should be discussed with politicians and policy uh, makers. Amanda, director of uh, 
met, let me not executive director of Asia Pacific Global Institute of Sustainable Sustainability and Innovation. Sustainability, another topic which we are discussing a lot, but if we look in the curriculum of different universities, unfortunately, we don't find too much. So I'm questioning how much universities are doing in order to prepare the future graduates for these topics. I'm sure Amanda will explain to us or introduce to us more other challenges. Amanda, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Enga mana, enga reo, enga rangatira tanga, tena koto katoa. So greetings to everybody in Māori, which is the indigenous language of Aotearoa, New Zealand, my birthplace. And I started with that because the kind of sustainable models that indigenous peoples have been living for centuries are now being recognized as very critical and integral to the notions of inclusivity that we've been talking about the past couple of days. And thank you for highlighting just how important it is for governments to realize the critical centrality of sustainability. And I would even go further and argue now of regenerative education. So I'm gonna report on the session that we ran in collaboration with Paul Srivastaya. And we looked at capacity, we looked at content, and we looked at collaboration. We know from the brilliant paper that Gary and others have written that capacity is a really serious issue. But with the systems that we have now, with AI and with digital enhanced learning, and as we talked about the personal, personalized pedagogies that were raised in the papers, we really can make an exponential difference. And we saw this as universities pivoted during the pandemic. The university where Julie Wrigley has her center actually has increased its reach considerably post pandemic. And so I think we also need to look at the opportunities that these kinds of crises can afford us. Now, in terms of content, sustainability, Back in 2003, the Global Institute of Sustainability was first created, and there are now over 500 around the world. We know two from the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, and the world's first ever globally agreed development agenda. And indeed, I was ambassador to the United Nations at the time. And while the Sustainable Development Goals are not perfect, it did represent a successful multilateral process which created a common language. And that is the common language I think that we all need to be using to create content. Collaboration is the new issue too. And it's not just collaboration between universities, although it's wonderful to know that that is so strong, but it's also collaboration between a range of perhaps unexpected partners. We do expect universities to be providing the right kind of input for those who are going to be our future leaders. And we at ASU have a commitment that every single graduate will graduate with sustainability competency. So some of the other things that are really critical is this notion of inclusivity. Our charter says we judge ourselves and our success not by who we exclude, but by whom we include. And that is really important when we consider that there are still some 700 million who don't even have basic literacy. The concept of innovation has been well covered and I love these new words, nimbility, uh, that Fernando used and diversity and innovation as an absolute strength. We talked about regenerative futures in our session too, because so much damage has been done to our poor planet that sustainability is no longer enough. We know we need to be thinking in terms now of circular economy, of drawdown, whether that be nature-based solutions or technological solutions. And without an integral knowledge of that, given the existential crisis that climate change represents, we are not going to have a safe future. And having just returned from COP26 and noting that the largest single grouping were fossil fuel lobbyists 
at some over 500. The points that you've just made about the importance of our being able to influence the private sector and governments for better outcomes could not come at a more timely moment. And universities really need to step into this void of global governance and the irresponsibility of the private sector. So for me, a couple of points of radical collaboration, I'd like to give examples. And first of all, a, a very new approach launched last year, the Global Futures Laboratory at ASU, which brings together a range of different disciplines. It is decidedly and determinedly transdisciplinary. So the idea is that the arts and the sciences must collaborate. Uh, it is hard to do, but it is a journey. And it's a journey I think all universities need to be on now. So within that, there's the discovery space of learning and how it is that we can bring that learning to a broader audience. And I'll just give one example. Two months ago, one of our scientists mapped for the first time the world's global tropical shallow coral reefs for the first time ever, which now allows us to analyze the oceans and the buffer zones that are provided in, in uh, relation to climate change, as well as coral reef restoration. So some of these very interesting big research projects and linking those through radical partnership, it includes Natural Geographic, the Allen Coral Atlas, to name a few, bringing those to a broader audience of policymakers and seeing how that can really influence outcomes. So another partnership that we have as we take that discovery through into learning is with the Interparliamentary Union, 179 countries, parliamentarians who are not necessarily well versed in the sustainable development goals and providing them short educative pieces to show them how to meet their obligations. We know every country reports on progress under the sustainable development goals every year. So you'll see a link to some of that training and an idea of how that can be carried forward to educate a broader audience. Other groups groups like the International Science Council, the Nobel Foundation, the International University Climate Alliance. How is it that we can bring together a group of unlikely and radical partnerships so that higher education is able to influence right across the board? And I'll finish with one last example, which is the We Empower UN SDG Challenge, launched by the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, and by the president of the World Bank, along with the Council of Women World Leaders at the UN General Assembly, with a range of universities, encouraging women entrepreneurs, given all the systemic barriers that still exist, to become solutionaries, and for those solutions to be taken up in partnership by universities, the UN, the World Bank, and indeed the private sector. So just to sum up, the critical importance of sustainability and going beyond sustainability to regenerative futures, the importance of addressing capacity of higher learning, and through that means of personalized pedagogy, individual learning, and lifelong learning. We've just opened a center at ASU for retirees who want to continue to be lifelong learners on campus. And then the content, making sure that that content is absolutely relevant, as Francisco just said. And then collaboration. How do we make sure that through radical collaboration, we as universities are influencing the future agenda and what I hope will become the regenerative development goals. Thank you all so much for this very worthwhile initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for uh, your intervention. Also, congratulate you and your colleagues from Arizona State University. I visited the university. I have followed the great um, projects that you and uh, your president uh, developed in the last, uh, uh, I would say, 10 years. In some um, areas, even you succeeded to challenge the best uh, U.S. universities and well-known universities, which is uh, interesting. And uh, also, uh, as a professor and as a former Minister of Education, 
I would like once again to underline a mistake which also I did, and I, I do believe I still do this mistake. We assess the work on higher education just based on the prestige of research. We don't assess the work of our professors based on the influence that they have on some public policies or based on the influence that they have on their students within or outside the class uh, uh, work. So in Arizona, you State University, you are looking very carefully to this. I was uh, witnessing at one moment how you inform local authorities about the average amount, um, uh, amount of drugs consumption in a city based on some residual analytics and uh, advised on different public policies. So very bold and very uh, impressive. So thank you, Amanda, for your intervention. Ismail, Your Excellency, Alexandria Library has, I would, I would dare to say, has the shape of your intellectual background. And it's an international shape. So please, I'm eager to hear your view about higher education. It was mentioned by Francisco, also the tension between national and international, even a kind of aggressive discourse when you say, I'm going to cooperate with some, I don't know, international organization or institutions, you have the floor. Uh, I think uh, we have really uh, a transformation going on in the world and uh, higher education is not going to be the, or it doesn't seem to be at present anyway, uh, the uh, force that will shape the way uh, uh, the future is going. The way the future is going right now uh, is uh, being shaped by many, many decisions that are uh, uh, fundamental. And uh, all over the place, uh, people talk about AI and robotics and so on. They're more aware of the, the uh, IT side of it, but because I'm involved in that other side, I will tell you that the revolution in biology is going as fast, uh, even perhaps faster than people imagine in terms of uh, uh, the IT side. And when the merger of the two come together, you get breakthroughs that pose very profound questions uh, for which society as a whole, and certainly not the governing structures that exist, are ready to address the ethical and other dimensions of that. For example, uh, we now have biological robots that uh, are created from uh, uh, stem cells of uh, frogs, African frogs, and uh, they assemble them into micro uh, 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 Pac-Man looking little blobs. And now these little blobs can create their own biological robots, second generation, only one so far that we know. But I mean, just think about what we're talking about, real live biological cells that are functioning as robots in the sense of doing things uh, for humans at the instruction of humans or at the initiation of humans, and then functioning with a certain amount of autonomy. These things are happening right across the board. And uh, we have another reality, which was, I think, rightly pointed out by the speakers, where the whole world whether you're talking about climate change, whether you're talking about food security, whether you're talking about uh, access to education, whether you're talking about inequality, uh, et cetera. Uh, we have a global set of problems. The pandemic is one of them, but these global sets of problems are captured partly or, or not captured partly by the fact that they require this level of global cooperation at the systemic and societal level, not just at the particular project or initiative, if they're going to have a major impact on these global trends. Uh, just to give an idea of what I'm talking about, think my friends who 
Ben Cerf, Bob Kane, and the others, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, uh, our British friends at MIT, who invented the internet. Uh, I don't think anybody could visualize how it would totally reshape everything from social media to uh, work patterns to banking uh, transactions to globalization and trade. Everything was being transformed. The marriage between the, the, the uh, mobile phone and the internet has created a totally new society, a, a, a highly hyperlinked society of young people. And the penetration of, uh, of the mobile phone, the handheld device, is changing the relationship between people, not just in the fact that they can text and talk to each other and so on, but also in the kinds of transactions they can do. And even in places like Kenya, for example, you would find banking being done among the poorest of the poor through mobile phones in the M-Pesa and so on. And I believe that therefore there are many profound transformation that require us to rethink uh, the way uh, we think about uh, knowledge, education, information, etc. I think data, when uh, uh, organized, becomes information; when explained, becomes knowledge. But we need more. We need wisdom, and wisdom must involve values, beliefs, uh, uh, ethics, uh, along with that. Now, I won't go through the transformative character of the knowledge, pluridisciplinarity, convergence, uh, computing, complexity, chaos, humans and machines, images and text, parsing, big, big data, internet explosion. We have to remember every human being, or on average, 1.7 megabytes of data is created every second by every person during 2020. And uh, the internet of things, machines are beginning to talk to machines. What will that do? It is not the kind of ideal structure that we advocate within our universities that is going to dominate these very profound transformative changes. So if we go back to the function of education, what are the characteristics of the mind that we wish to nurture and cultivate? And Howard Gardner, of course, uh, in his classic Frames of Mind in 1983, uh, he talked about, uh, more recently, the minds of our youth that are, they need the ability to synthesize, as well as to be disciplined and respectful of others, creative and ethical. And ethical becomes more and more important. I just mentioned one example from the Xenobots, but from uh, life, we can now has also already been done, apply these new biological techniques to edit human beings. And what does that do for us? So we need to have a critical and synthesizing mind endowed with imagination and creativity. And I would always strongly support a curious mind because curiosity driven science is where the best things come from. And a disciplined and respectful mind that, that gives weight to the opinions of others that looks for inclusion and an ethical mind because not everything that is technically feasible is ethically desirable. And I think with that, we will have the, the ability to say to uh, what we are doing with the next generation in uh, educational framework, we are helping them to cope with the coming transformation. And that therefore the education for tomorrow is going to be very different, but it will also be remarkably remaining as it is. For the, the, the 9 billion people on the planet, schools are going to be uh, continued and very large part of formal education will take place in, in established schools and universities. And it was, has been, the research excellence in the university has been a question that we know, but distance guided learning, in fact, the University of People has grown to 100,000 people in a couple of years. And uh, uh, the lifelong education for employment as people, whatever skills they have learned have to be upgraded every little while, but also the lifelong education for personal cultural enrichment. I want to attend uh, units and courses that deal with the history of art. Well, I'll be able to do it online right now in ways that didn't exist before. And as we invent this new education, yes, as was said, we have to think of the content, the methods, 
not the authority figure in the classroom that teaches, but the, the, the methods of teaching, the participants, they will still be the families and the teachers and the, the, the friends and peers. But now we will have peers online as well as avatars and, and holograms, as well as dealing with uh, uh, the more usual units of society and also dealing with the, the structures of society that have to transform themselves, libraries, museums, archives, exhibits, as well as recognizing that the role of the mass media, which used to be television and, and, and cinema and newspapers and radio has now moved to social media where everybody is a participant and a creator as well as a recipient. But then can we think of the abolition of these obsolete structures that we have inherited from the 19th and 20th century. I don't think so. And I, the reason I say that is because I believe that there are five, five essential transitions uh, that occur between the ages of 15 and 24 uh, in most societies and that make these years particularly relevant and important from high school and university years. They mediate all these transitions. Secondly, we must also uh, uh, I think recognize that it is unhealthy for children uh, to uh, learn simply with adults staying at home or something like that, because a large part of education process is socialization. We are creating not just the amount, it's not just imparting knowledge or even imparting values. It is nurturing the individual, as was said earlier on, to be the individual and become a citizen. So what are these five major transitions that will continue to be mediated largely by the education system? First is the decision to continue studying, not dropping out. Second, to merge into the workforce in some way because work style, home style will be very different. Third, adopting a healthy life lifestyle, not on drugs, safe sex, avoiding uh, uh, unhealthy uh, habits, starting a family, but also learning and experimenting to exercise citizenship. And to do that, we need to have, create expanding opportunities, enhance the capabilities. And this is very, very important. Provide second chances. Don't say that somebody who has failed and dropped out is hopeless. No, we must find ways of applying these to every single one of these five transitions, because that is how we will create a, a stronger group of citizens who have an ethical foundation and who can indeed look to the future, look to others who are less fortunate than themselves, and also learn and continue to flourish in a system that is driven by their own curiosity and that allows each individual to reach the full extent of their abilities and give back to society the full measure of their talents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Sarah Jaldin, dear Ismail. I was listening very carefully. And uh, once again, I was thinking at the transition from idea to practice. And uh, I enjoyed all your uh, ideas and proposals and even the way you are picture the future of education and you use the word avatar. Let me share with you, and this is a recorded conference, what kind of feedback I received in 2013 when I said I will not provide textbooks the same format like the beginning of 19th century, and the new textbooks will be digital. And someone, a good friend of mine, came to me saying, are you crazy? What do you mean by digital textbooks? We all learn from the classical textbooks, and here we are. So, Unfortunately, adults and many of them having decision position, they cannot see to the future otherwise than using the old models. So it is a battle and probably uh, this is the reason for which all decided to attend immediately to organize and to attend to this conference because, because it is a battle to put in practice simple ideas, which are not necessary ideas for the future. So when you said avatar, this is not future, it's today. 
this kind of instrument can be used today. The question of tomorrow is just a transformation of this tool as a mass trans uh, 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 tool that would be used for uh, all. Because also Francisco mentioned something which is very true, the battle for access and equity is not done. And we have a big amount of, a big number of uh, uh, teachers which who are not in the classroom. So alternative instruments, digital instruments, distance learning instruments should be used. And these are not about the future. My, my role will stop here. In fact, Gary was the driver of this conference. And Gary, you have the floor to conclude our conference. Thank you, Ramus, and thank you to our very distinguished speakers for this final closing session, who I think we have covered such a vast territory uh, and, and so many complex issues, but it was very nice and refreshing to bring it back at the end towards what's practically being done by those who are leading uh, innovation in the field, uh, uh, through IAUP, through Arizona State, through Qatar Foundation, and Ishmael, who is always at the leading edge uh, of where uh, society is evolving uh, on critical issues such as this, now as a co-chair of NGIC, the Zami Ganjabi Foundation, and a dear friend and fellow. Uh, I would like to spend just a few minutes, certainly not trying to summarize the very, very rich content of this three days, more than 100 speakers in 20 sessions. But I'd like to share a few thoughts on why we have organized the conference in this way, uh, where it has come from, what we were attempting to do, and how we will benefit from the insights that have been generated up until now. Uh, the Academy really took a stop and at, reflected on its work back in 2013, uh, which has a long distinguished history of looking at leading edge issues way back to the environmental issue before it was considered an issue and the population explosion uh, and the IT industry at its early stages and so forth. But like many institutions in the world, we had been looking at these things in as separate, the nuclear issue and so forth. We had been looking at them as separate, in separate dimensions. And in 2013, when we were invited by the United Nations office in Geneva to co-organize a conference of a few hundred diplomats, we chose as the topic for that, the need for a new paradigm in human affairs. And predominant topic of that conference was to look at the pressing global challenges confronting humanity. All of them we have discussed in one way or another during these sessions, the ecological challenges, the economic challenges, the political, the military security challenges, the social challenges, the problems of inequality. Uh, and, uh, and particularly, the challenge to the future of education. But once again, we tended to be looking at them each as an important component of some larger whole without really being very clear what that larger whole was or what the interrelationships between these challenges were. And so we embarked on a program for the last eight years, looking at each of these each of these issues in relation to all the others. We had a, a wonderful sessions on the role of individuality, which is a rare topic in, in the social sciences, the role of the individual in social change, the process of social change, the, the, cut, the, the process of my, the way we think and different types of creativity, the role of human values and ethics in social evolution. We had a, for five years an international working group on new economic theory. The irony was out of our 50 members, more than half were not economists. 
They came from all different uh, uh, professions, looking at economy as an integral part of society. Obviously, from an ecological point of view, from a political point of view, from a legal point of view, from a social point of view. We look at the issue of social power, something that doesn't really fall within the frame of any specific social science, but we saw all of the activities in society are being governed by this invisible thing, uh, whether it's the economic activity or political activity or social activity or technological activity of where the power comes from in society. We looked at democracy. We looked at the role of culture, essential role of culture. We have two projects, ongoing projects on the financial sector and revolution in finance and the need for revolutionary change. We looked at global governance. In just in the last two years, we undertook a project with the United Nations office in Geneva again on global leadership in the 21st century. And all of this was an attempt to try to put together and piece together the different elements that we had been examining and see the world is only one. The world doesn't lend itself to an easy fragmentation, even though we do it very well in our uh, academic disciplines. And what does this tell us about the future governance of the world? The advent of the pandemic, of course, made it so self-evident that it didn't require a discussion anymore because the pandemic presented us with a dilemma that covered virtually every issue that we had been studying over the previous eight years and showed it was not on anybody's security agenda. It was not on anybody's security budgets. It did not respect any borders or boundaries. It did not adhere to any uh, security strategies. And yet it made clear that these issues are all inseparable from one another. During the course of this, we took an important step with the help of Ishmael and uh, uh, with the uh, IAUP as our founding members. We had a meeting in 2014 at the Library of Alexandria to found the World University Consortium, particularly because we had a sense and I sense that I feel has been very much reinforced from our work since then, that education has a critical role to play in all these issues. And if we are going to do better in the future than we have in the past, education is the, the most organized conscious instrument we have for refining our responses as global society evolves so rapidly. And that led to four prior international conferences, the first at UC Berkeley, my alma mater, when the online education was just taking off, then in Rome, in Rio, in Belgrade, and finally after delay because of COVID, uh, this one. And what we've tried to do in this one, covering a very vast area, was not to look at all the pieces, but to see how all the elements of this fit together as one integral, inseparable reality. And the solution to each of them depends on the others. Uh, and yet we put education as a central focus because we feel this is the institution which both from within the existing base, and it's very encouraging to hear about work like ASU is you doing, uh, the Qatar Foundation is doing, uh, University of the People is doing. Uh, we've looked a lot at the innovations that are emerging, but it was quite clear that all the innovations are just the tip of an iceberg. We are, we believe we're approaching a major disruption in the field of education, a key akin to what we have seen and is undergone in the field of finance now uh, in recent times. Uh, when traditional financial institutions, traditional investment strategies, traditional monetary policies are all being challenged simply by the pressure uh, of rapid change and, uh, and, and the dynamics of the society. We don't predict or wish that 
we lose the great institutions of education, we feel that the opening up and experimentation and creativity and innovation in education is absolutely vital to leadership in the future. Much of that we hope will come from within the existing institutions. Much of it is already beginning to come from outside the existing institutions because it's a, a world's need, it's a global aspiration. So our attempt in this meeting, you could call it an experiment, was to try to see how, to, to understand this from the point of view of the whole, from the point of view of the whole of humanity, from the point of view of all of the sectors and dimensions of society, from the point of view of all the disciplines, from the point of view of global society, national society, institutions, and individuals, because in fact, they are not separate realities. We live in one uh, inseparable, integrated reality. We've also tried uh, in, a, in more than before to go back to an inspiration of our founders who back in 1960 named this very consciously the World Academy of Art and Science. And it took us a lot of research to clarify what, why they did that and what they really meant by that. But it was very clear when we read back on the original documentation that the art, what they meant by the art was to recognize that the objective reality that we study through the, the, the natural sciences and the subjective reality of human emotions, human values, human aspirations, perceptions, uh, cultures, uh, are two inseparable parts of reality. Uh, and true knowledge and true effectivity comes from a proper marriage and blend of them. And in education, we have gone a long way, a long distance away from the older tradition in which art and humanities and science and history and philosophy were looked at as integral elements. Uh, so much so that I was uh, participated in a conference which had one of the most respected leaders in technology in Western America, very famous for his books. He proudly came back from a, a meeting with 25 presidents of universities in California, the meeting was in California, and said that he had advised them to simply dispense with the humanities because it was obsolete and no longer. Uh, necessary. And that reminded me very much of, of how serious and important it is. What we need today and what we've heard from speakers in all our sessions is, and it was very eloquently expressed in this session, is the past, however rich it has been, cannot be our guide and uh, compass for the future. Uh, our past experience, even our past successes, we, we have to invent the future or think of discovered or discover the future, or we have to create. It. And therefore, our education is going to have to be much more in future, a creative process of envisioning, imagining, and creating the freedom of thought uh, and the instrumentation to use our mind differently rather than just to catalog and repeat what's been known in the past. 